thanks for having me again. Um, it's always interesting and a challenge to encapsulate the natural disturbance program in 20 minutes. Um, and I actually really liked the, the title, theme this year, of meeting the challenge. And I thought I'd, I'd, I'd play on that a little bit because um, challenges within the natural disturbance program have been um, ever present. And we're actually at a bit of a crossroads now within the program. We have a program review next week that some of you hopefully will be participating in. Um, and so what I'm going to do is sort of play on this and, and tell you a little bit of a story here that en en encapsulates some of those challenges. So as I say, pull up a chair. So I'm going to start with something really simple and I'll build on that. So the tactical planning challenge, really simple idea of in terms of how do I uh, design harvest areas and prescribe burns to have more natural features. And that came from a sense 15, 20 years ago that we have some pretty fundamental differences in how we've been doing disturbance on the landscape relative to what's been happening out there naturally. So as part of a resolution for this, first step is to understand the patterns of natural forest fires. And without getting into some of the technical details, we've gathered information at a really high level of resolution of uh, fires that have not been had any fire control and burned under natural conditions. And there's a picture of a, um, a guy using soft copy to, to develop that. Well, we started out with phase one in 1998 in this project. And actually, through the last 13 years and 19 partners, um, we're now at the end of phase four. Uh, two of those, I should say, I did actually as Bandaloop, but the, I developed the methods um, and all of the people and tools uh, through the uh, FRI to do it, and I did exactly the same, thinking that one day these data sets would be brought together, and that, that's this year. Um, this actually may expand east and west. I've been talking to both BC and Manitoba, so this could become almost a national level database. This, uh, and I've been talking with Debbie about this, this is probably a layer that will end up on FRI Mapper, so you'll be able to look at all of these fires. And of course, with all of that comes a lot of analysis. Um, I know you'd be, you did take my banana. <laughs> I can't believe you took my banana. I was on the podium. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not going to explain every single one of the graphs. I know you're not going to take me seriously if I have a banana, are you? Okay. No, it's all right. It's okay. I'm a walker. Um, what I wanted to point out is that there aren't any numbers up there, right? These are, the graphs are all um, equations, the, there's a huge spread of the data, and there's frequency distributions. And that's one of the first lessons we learned. And, and, and therein lies one of the first big challenges, right? This is, this is about a natural range. You can't represent them by a number, this is how you represent them, right? So that has to get translated into management, and into regulatory uh, uh, systems, right? So how the heck, thanks, thanks for all the data and all the research, Dave, that's great, but how the heck are we gonna use this? Okay, if, if, mother, and, and, you know, if mother nature can, is that variable, then how does that get used? So where that led to um, a couple of things, uh, first is Neptune, which is um, the planning tool and there's some screenshots up here, and you'll recognize actually that the interface for this is exactly the same as FRI Mapper, and it's also open source. Um, and one day, and Debbie and I have been talking about this, we'll be able to actually link these two together quite easily. But what this does is uses the spatial language developed by the research, and then converts files over, and it can be a, a fire, it could be cut block, it doesn't matter, convert them over into the language, and then you can compare the natural range of the frequency distributions for 10 metrics. We've got seven partners for Neptune now, so it's available online and it's open source. Um, seven partners, including two provincial governments, the federal government, and four companies from two different provinces. Um, the next, uh, we, we also have, ha have had on the books a natural disturbance short course for designing disturbance events. Um, and the idea behind that is that we are going to actually use Neptune as a part of the course to help do that, and we're going to develop it as, a, as an online course. 
Um, that's in its infancy, but that's the plan. And there will be some progress this year on that. So, one could say, well, that's fine. You've got Neptune and you've got the short course here, but you know what? It's, it doesn't really work for me in riparian zones. We did a whole bunch of research in riparian zones that showed, sure enough, fires go right through riparian zones almost as much as they do in the upland. We're not going to be harvesting in riparian zones, so, well, the natural disturbance model breaks down here, doesn't it? And we said, well, does it? Okay. Does the natural disturbance model break down? If we take a closer look at disturbance, one of the first order effects is what? It kills trees and trees fall down. When we start talking about riparian zones, we're talking about woody debris. And if we take a look at these two little toy images here, um, which one of these is going to have um, the, the greater capacity to mitigate flooding effects? Which one is going to have the, uh, a high ratio of uh, riffle pools? Which one is going to have the spawning grounds? Which one would you rather fish in? Which one is going to have higher levels of aquatic diversity? Which one is going to be able to trap sediment? And on and on and on, right? It, you, you can't talk about the health of small streams, of headwater streams, without talking about woody debris. Okay? And, and there's a lot we can learn about woody debris through the right techniques. And what we learned is that wood's been there a long time. I won't go into the details on, on, on the results, but the lesson here for us was not only there's some in good information here on the natural range of how much and the quality and the type of wood that's in these streams, in and near these streams and how it functions, but also how long it lasts. So let's play this forward. If we ignore this ish as an issue and we don't manage for woody debris for the next 30 or 40 years, we might not notice it. And then all of a sudden, there's going to be, there's going to be this, uh, you know, we're not going to have enough wood. So we have to manage wood in small streams today if we're going to have healthy streams, you know, two or three decades from now. So let's go up a level of planning. Um, another question, how much old forest should we manage for to safely be within the historic range? And this goes to all kinds of issues, including the harvest level. You have to account for fire control effectiveness because, of course, we're not just talking about harvesting on, on this landscape. We have to, you know, fire is going to happen. Fine filter values. Uh, old growth isn't, you know, it's, we're not just talking about coarse filter issue here, are we? We're talking about habitat for a species um, that we value. Um, and that last question, which I'll get to, which is, what is old forest? So, and I've shown you this before, but I'll just go over it uh, quickly. It's not that difficult to go back on a landscape and say, all right, before we were there on the landscape, before there was fire control, before we had any roads and harvesting, what did it look like? And in this case, in the Hinton Water Products FMA, we've got 4% old. Okay? Now the problem is with that, that's just one snapshot in time, and this is a highly dynamic landscape. Okay? So through simulation modeling, what we can do is create, again, a frequency distribution. Right? It's all about frequency distributions. It's all about the range. And there's that 4%, right? There's 4%. That's what we had in 1950. Here's what we have in 1998. One number is no more natural from a biological perspective. They're equally natural. You can't compare those two and say one is better than the other from a biological perspective. So now what we're doing is we manage for risk, right? And that was the lesson we learned out of this one. That, all right, if we're going to start to drop below, let's say 5% or 10% or whatever number you want to pick, we have to think that there's still going to be fires overlaying, right? So maybe that's a risk we don't want to take. Maybe that's how we set a threshold for old forest, is by looking at our values. So this technique was developed, well, more than 10 years ago now, and has been used on several um, FMAs across the province. Um, and this one is still sort of going strong. Now, let's get to that question of old, because the assumption is we've got when you're doing simulation modeling, when you're talking about old forest, that you've got all the assumptions right, that this is a stand replacing uh, regime. In other words, fires more or less start the biological clock at zero, wherever they burn. And 
Um, old is from that time forward until it gets disturbed again. And this has been increasingly challenged in the foothills. And what we did is said, let's, let's do our own pilot study and let's go so far north where we imagine, you know, it can't possibly be a multi-age stand there. And what we found actually is return intervals in the Berlin in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 to 50 years. Okay, low intensity fires, lots of fire scars. So, and, and there have been other related studies. So this, um, this raises some really interesting questions. Okay, um, and I'll, I'll show you one more thing before I, before I go on here, because this got me thinking, if this is true in the foothills, can I find other evidence? And so what I did is I looked around for other fires that might have burned in low intensity. And I found this fire burned in 1939, 5,200 hectares, most of it light to moderate burn. Okay, so this, would, this is definitely not a stand replacing fire. And here it is, right in the middle of the Spray Lakes FMA. Okay, and you can see the harvesting north of it in the blocks here. And so that area is 70 years old now. That's a light to moderate burn. I was talking with Alan Carroll last week at UBC, who's a climate change specialist, and he and the pathologist at UBC, their nicknames are doom and gloom, because they're always talking about scenarios where, holy crap, this could happen. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna role play a little bit here, and let's talk about the possibility that we have it wrong about the front range. What if we have it wrong, and what we're seeing right now is a manifestation of fire control and our assumptions about it being even aged. What if it is a mixed fire regime? What if the whole thing is? It means fundamentally, well right now for one thing, it means we're probably at the edge or outside of the natural range. We're already beyond NRV, okay? even in the areas where we haven't been harvesting, we haven't been doing anything. It means the habitat has changed so fundamentally, maybe there's habitat that used to exist on this landscape for caribou, for grizzly bear, that doesn't exist anymore in substantive, num substantive numbers, right? It also means that we have a system that is stressed, okay? Its resilience is, is um, down fairly low, and let's translate that into systems that are most likely to be affected by climate change. We might have a prime candidate right here because it's so far beyond the range. It also explains why things like mountain pine beetle really like the foothills now, and why they haven't in the past, right? So we're not finished with this study yet, um, but it opens up all kinds of possibilities. And this led to another project we did, actually for the Land Use Secretariat this year, that we just finished, where we started overlaying what we know about the fire regimes with what's happened in the ecotones. And here we've got um, a, little, uh, a little diagram that was in our final report in it when we uh, discuss interactions between wildfire, tank caterpillar, bison, which don't exist on the landscape anymore, and mountain pine beetle, which didn't exist on the landscape, but does now. So now, let's talk about the, the potential consequences of this, changing the fire regime, removing um, the grazers, um, and essentially not allowing the eco the ecotone is where you're going to see climate change happen. There's really strong ties right across the world of latitudinal and altitudinal uh, ecotones moving. That's where you study climate change, right? If we want to know about climate change, this is where to look. Okay? This, the study of this in a modeling exercise for the North Saskatchewan could yield some really really interesting insights into where this landscape is going to go, even under business as usual. Um, the other question that it raises actually is what it is we think we know about old forest. What is old forest? And this is a really this is something that I'm just starting to, to think about, but do we have it right? Um, is is if, if it's a multiple uh, if it's a multiple regime system, then maybe old forest isn't something that hasn't been disturbed for 100 or 120 years. Maybe that's so, uh, that's an incredibly rare occurrence. And the other thing is, maybe we have it wrong. If we're going to talk about the most important point 
in a in a Stan's life. And I heard the every time I, I hear people talk about disturbance or uh, fire, they talk about recovery, right? And we heard it yesterday. The Stan's going to recover. Well, maybe the for the most important ten years in the life of a Stan is the first ten years, not the last ten years. Maybe for biodiversity purposes, it's that first ten years that we have to look after. Maybe that's more important. Maybe. So, now let's take it up to a whole different way of thinking about natural patterns. Okay? Um, and this was um, the Healthy Landscapes Project that we did as a pilot study. And it takes the idea of using natural patterns as actually the foundation for decision making. So you don't start the discussion with my value is caribou, my, my value is grizzly bears, I want to have recreation, then you know, we have to get rid of mountain pine beetle. Let's see if the natural disturbance model of what we understand, just understand about the landscape and where it's going, can tell us anything about how to manage for these. So what we did, um, so the idea is that if you take this whole box as a natural range of variation, not just disturbance, but biological or landscape condition, and you've already had one example of that with the woody debris, right? Biological consequences, an example of that would be mountain pine beetle threat. All of those things have a natural range, we can capture them all. If you get the stuff in this gray box about right, you're going to get these outputs, okay? So we're sort of turning the, the question on its head. And the first thing we did was did an assessment of the landscape, and what we found, especially in, in and near the, the foothills, is that we have old forest that's outside of the natural range of variation, which isn't that big a surprise, really, depending on where you are. Um, but what that means, of course, is that the mountain pine beetle threat is also outside the natural range. We haven't experienced mountain pine beetle threat like this, and so that's where it sits. Now, the other issue is, um, I, I know this is a, and, and you're, probably, you're probably cringing at this, all the water people using ECA, but um, it was a quick and dirty indicator. Um, and what's happening is that the equivalent clear cut area indicator was off the charts on the other end. Okay, so we have an issue here and that it may again go to that definition of what do we think old forest it is, old forest is in the foothills, and and what is that original disturbance regime? So that, that could have a lot to do with what's going on here. But we have, you know, this isn't necessarily news, but we've got old forest, we've got a lack of disturbance, and it's causing issues, okay? So, in terms of the future, um, we can model different scenarios forward. The one on the left here is business as usual. If we just keep going the way we are, um, and so we've got, you can see the division between the FMA holders and the dark green are, is um, old forest and the parks at the current rate of their prescribed burn. Um, they're going to keep continue to fall behind even further on, on uh, old growth levels. They're, it's just going to keep building up. And what happens out here is you have old forest, but it's going to be scattered in little pieces. So this was one, just, just one of the scenarios that we did in an attempt to say, what if we just got rid of the jurisdictional boundaries and we said, let's manage for reasonable size old forest patches. What do we get? Um, and this is, and, and the size of a lot of these patches are easily large enough for caribou, for example. Um, and this supplied actually more wood to, to mills uh, than that one did. Um, it did mean that uh, the prescribed burn budget would have to increase by, I don't know, 20-fold. <laughs> but, it, you know, it was it's sort of a demonstration. If this is where we want to go, this is what's going to have to happen. So, the challenges associated with the natural disturbance program. Um, it, it's not just learning about patterns. We also have to explore questions that relate to if or how or when or what degree to use that knowledge, okay? Um, and, and through the process of the last 15 years or so, that always hasn't been clear. The research, this, this is the easy part. Um, it, it really is. 
this is this is tough. This is a challenge not just for the natural disturbance program, but well, essentially all of us. Right? So in terms of challenges, you know, and, and, and again these are these are issues that the natural disturbance activity team is dealing with right now. Okay, we're we're sort of we're sort of facing this too, is that we're gonna have to redefine ourselves perhaps in, in light of these challenges. So what is a natural pattern? And we keep talking about natural disturbance, and it's the natural disturbance program, but we've clearly moved beyond that, right? We're, the Woody Debris Program is a good example of that. Uh, the Healthy Landscapes Modeling is a good example of that. So, so how far do we take that idea? We can talk about the natural patterns of grizzly bear habitat, of caribou habitat, right? That's, that's entirely possible, and there is a natural range associated with it. Um, we know they don't align well with the current planning and regulatory systems, and it has to do with those frequency distributions, the darn variability, which you know everyone curses. Well, it could be a huge opportunity. This could be a huge opportunity to actually make things easier, not more difficult for planners and regulators. But a lot of changes are going to have to happen. The historical range is often very different of what we see today. Here's the natural range, here's where we are. Well, throw up your, it's easy to throw up your hands and say, well, that's really tough, and who's going to care? So what we need to do, uh, in terms of this one, is we need to start to do that so what research, biological consequences. Um, and we've started along that path, and hopefully we're going to have more good conversations about it with some uh, very uh, well-qualified folks at U of A, uh, Ellen and John. Um, it's not exactly clear to use how to how to use what we're learning. Do we use it as a tool? Do you do, do you just want a simple course filter tool, a bunch of indicators, and that's it, and then we'll stop? Do we keep exploring the idea of using these as the basis for management? Do we take it into demonstrations and exercises um, and keep expanding those on the landscape? The potential here is huge, and this is the original intent of an NRV strategy as it was outlined by the, the fathers of ecosystem-based management. This is what they meant. Not you're going to create these natural patterns and thou shalt follow them. That was never the intent. Okay, so we're really talking about what is an ND approach now? And, and, and it could be anything, but it's something that we have to have a discussion on. I think that's a challenge for us now is that let's, let's land on something or at least how we're going to move forward with it. Because really what we're talking about is a philosophical shift in how, not just how we manage, but what it is we think we're managing. Okay? We're talking about managing entire systems, complex, intricate systems. And all the evidence points towards what we've been doing so far over the last 50 years is nothing but simplifying those systems. Okay? That's the, we have much simpler landscapes, much simpler stands. The complexity out of the whole boreal forest is, 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 is declining. That's the biggest shift. So how do we use that change in thought to start to move forward? So again, I think maybe, and maybe that's the biggest challenge of all, because it, 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 it's not the way we were taught, right? 